I think we have to go back to scripture, not to the culture, because the culture is giving us some very dangerous uh, prescriptions in terms of how we should pursue work. Uh, and when we realize, um, again, going back to Genesis, that work is significant, it's what we were created to do, and only we can do it uh, in, the way, in the unique way that God has created us, uh, then in that, there's dignity and there's fulfillment. And I don't think the cultural uh, myths can give us that dignity, nor can we ever find fulfillment. I actually think that those cultural myths lead to despair uh, and chasing the wrong things. So if we want to chase the right things, we have to first be grounded in who did God create me to be, and then follow that with integrity and excellence. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on when you're watching this. My name is Tim Weinhold. I am the Director of Faith and Business for Eventide Funds, a biblical values-based mutual fund in Boston. I've also spent my entire life in business, both as an entrepreneur and as, for a number of years, a consultant to large corporations related to their real estate. But enough about me. So let's jump in with a provocative question. Is God a capitalist? What do you think? Well, for a great many Christian business people, it's more than simply a provocative question. It goes to the very legitimacy of their chosen vocation, which means the question is worth our careful consideration. As a way into grappling with this question, it is helpful to understand that is God a capitalist is really asking two different things. It is asking, on the one hand, is God a fan of capitalism? And it is also asking, is God a fan of business? Let's tackle that, is God a fan of capitalism, question first. Now, many Christian business people believe the answer to that question is absolutely, or of course. And scripture provides some important support for that viewpoint. For example, the Bible is unambiguous about the legitimacy of private property. We see this in many places, but it comes through especially clearly in the seventh of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal. There's no reason for that commandment unless private property is entirely legitimate. And if private property is a good thing, then it follows almost by definition that so is private enterprise. We also see in various Old Testament passages that God is adamant that purchase and sale transactions be conducted with scrupulous honesty. You'll see that in Leviticus in a number of instances. This provides strong, implicit evidence that God approves of business commerce. Even more importantly, Deuteronomy 8, 17 and 18, an especially important passage for business people, instructs us that the ability to create wealth, the compelling capability of free enterprise business, is not even a human invention, but a divine gift. We also find business activity showing up in the parables of Jesus. One of his stories is that of a farmer business person, in this case a vineyard owner, who seems intent on providing graciously paid employment to as many as possible. Modern-day business people may question the farmer's prudence, but Jesus' story clearly shows his acceptance of the legitimacy of business activity. This comes through even more pointedly in the parables that Jesus told of the talents and the minas, where he portrayed the work of his servants as that of investors actively enlarging their master's wealth. Jesus doesn't tell us what investments the servants made, but he clearly assumes the appropriateness of such money-making activity. So all of that, taken together, lays out a solid scriptural case for God being pro-capitalism. And yet, scripture is always more nuanced, more complex than any human ideology. So let's take a look at some of that complexity as it relates to a fuller understanding of God's posture towards capitalism. One of the priority themes in scripture is God's deep concern for the poor and vulnerable. A concern God makes clear that he expects his people to share and to act on with compassion and generosity. Deuteronomy 15, for example, instructs, if there is a poor man among you, 
You shall not harden your heart, nor close your hand to your poor brother, but you shall freely open your hand to him and generously lend him sufficient for his need and whatever he lacks. Or consider John the Baptist's reply when asked, what should we do then to live rightly before God? He answered bluntly, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Which sounds, by the way, surprisingly similar to the famous slogan popularized by Karl Marx, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Even more significantly, in Matthew 25, Jesus tells us that our eternal destinies will be determined by how we respond to those who are hungry and thirsty, or sick, or alone, or in prison. So God is deeply concerned about the poor and vulnerable and expects the same from his people. But capitalism has an entirely different orientation. Free market capitalism is premised on a belief in the inherent value of survival of the fittest competition. In fact, a foundational belief of capitalist ideology is that market competition produces the best possible outcomes, which means the rich deserve their riches, and though it's rarely acknowledged, the poor deserve their poverty. Here's another big conflict between God's economic thinking and that of capitalism. The winner-take-all nature of capitalism <clears throat> inexorably concentrates wealth. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. God foresaw this exact problem at the establishment of Israel, specifically related to the concentration of land ownership over time. Families might lose their land foolishly or through misfortune or as a result of the greedy misbehavior of those with power. Eventually, fewer and fewer people would own more and more of the land, a prospect God found deeply disturbing. So he did something extraordinary. His year of jubilee provision dictated that every 50 years, all land should be returned to its original owners or their descendants, and all debts should be canceled as well. This is clearly a giant reset in favor of the poor and to the disadvantage of the rich. But it is equally a reset meant to eliminate the inevitable tendency of free market competition to concentrate wealth and power. Which means that with his year of jubilee mandate, God imposed a radical constraint on the wealth accumulating dynamic at the heart of capitalism. In fact, with jubilee, God seems to have weighed in rather pointedly in favor of wealth distribution over unbridled wealth accumulation. Of course, that's just one chapter, right? And in the Old Testament, not the New. But then we get to this Acts chapter 2 description of the early church. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And Acts chapter 4 underlines this again, telling us all the believers were one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. This is not, as some contend, proof that God is a secret socialist. Still, scripture means it to be suggestive, hinting that the more thoroughly God's people embrace the essence of his kingdom, the more their economic relationships move from selfishness towards sharing. So, is God a capitalist or is he a socialist? Actually, let me propose a more helpful way and a more biblical way to think about God's economic orientation. We might label these God's principles of economic wisdom. Principle number one, it is always legitimate, even imperative, to ask how to increase the wealth and prosperity of an organization, a community, or a society. Principle number two, it is always legitimate, even imperative, to ask how economic wealth and rewards 
can be distributed with greater fairness and greater inclusivity. And principle number three, it is never legitimate to ask one question without the other. Capitalism has a laser focus on principle one. It cares greatly about maximizing production and very little about fair and just distribution. Socialism concentrates narrowly on principle two. It, offer, it concerns itself with equitable distribution, but offers naive and inefficient answers to the need for production, and even worse, inevitably requires a totalitarian regime for its implementation. In other words, capitalism cares about how to make the economic pie grow larger, but not whether some take extraordinarily large slices while others get only crumbs. Socialism cares about the relative fairness of the slices, yet ignores the fact that its policies tend to make the pie shrink for everyone. God's view, however, is that principle three is essential. He does not favor the selfishness and injustice that so often come part and parcel with capitalism, but neither does he favor the naivete and inefficiency, much less the totalitarianism that seem inextricably linked to socialism. Instead, he cares greatly and equally about wealth creation and wealth distribution. He is determined that economic activity be both productive and fair and inclusive in the distribution of its rewards. Because he cares about provision and prosperity for everyone, not just for the fortunate few. Okay, so God's answer to the question, <coughs> our scripture's answer, excuse me, to the question, is God a fan of capitalism, turns out to be sort of, or it's complicated. Well, what about the more pragmatic question, is God a fan of business? As a way into tackling this question, let me pose a rather different question. Is God a fan of marriage? I believe most Christians would answer quickly, yes, of course God is a fan of marriage. But let me suggest what I believe is a fuller, better answer to that question. God is a fan of some marriages and not a fan of others. God is a very big fan of marriages in which both spouses do a good job of loving each other. But God is certainly not a fan of marriages in which one or both spouses consistently act selfishly, harmfully, even abusively and violently towards the other. Which means marriage can be either a great blessing or a great curse, depending entirely on how it is practiced. Stating the obvious, God is a fan of marriages that create blessing, but not a fan of marriages that cause hurt, and harm and even destroy people's lives. The same is true of government. Scripture makes clear that government is a divine gift to humankind meant for our good. Nevertheless, it is very clear that government can be practiced in ways that cause people to flourish or to flounder. The same is true for business. God loves businesses that create blessing, that help people flourish. But he hates it when business is practiced in ways that create blight rather than blessing, hates it when business harms rather than helps. And this topic, what really distinguishes God pleasing from God pleasing, displeasing business will be the subject of our next two videos.